Hi, Stephen from Own or Disown. Last year, I reviewed the $1,200 Acer Predator Helios 300. Now, that model had a very red theme, uh, both on the chassis and the keyboard. And in 2019, Acer launched the blue theme Triton series, slimming down the bezels and chassis, but it has an inverted motherboard, making upgrading RAM and storage difficult. But for those seeking a laptop with a similar build and styling, but with a motherboard the right way around, they should consider the Helios 300. It comes in three flavors. There's an RTX 2070 Max-Q model for $2,400, an RTX 2060 for $1,600, and a GTX 1660 Ti for $1,200. And I'm telling you now, unless you need ray tracing, the 1660 Ti model is the one to get. Now they all come with the 9th gen i7-9758 CPU compared to the 8758 in the last gen's model. And although this CPU does improve things slightly compared to last year, it isn't a huge difference, as you can see from my hand, uh, handbrake and code. It performs similar to the 8th gen Triton 500, both with turbo mode activated. Turbo mode actually boosts the CPU from 45 watts to 56 watts and boosts the uh, CPU clock rate up to about 200 megahertz until it power throttles down to 45 watts. I use these throttle stop settings to boost it, same as I do for all of my laptops, and now it closes the gap to the 9th gen MSI GF75. You see similar in the shorter Cinebench R20 test, an improvement but nothing earth shattering. So with the CPU comparison out of the way, the main reason to buy this over the last generation is the, the design and the GPU. The first thing that will strike you is the nicely styled black anodized aluminium lid. You have the same Predator logo as before, but this time it has a subtle blue color and a blue motif accent on the side, you know, rather than red. Open up the lid and you will immediately notice that the bezels have been substantially reduced in size to 7.9 millimeters at the sides. And as a result, the image pops out more, despite the, set, the similar color accuracy as before of 94% of sRGB and 350 nits of brightness at 100%. It has a 79% screen to body ratio. Now not class leading, but definitely better than last year's model. The IPS panel is the same used on the Triton series and probably its main negative is backlight bleed, but it's only noticeable when you have a black screen. As last year, we still get a 1080p 144Hz panel and its ghosting performance is just as good. It's certainly much better than the 120Hz ASUS TUF505. The panel can also be boosted to a 3 millisecond response time, should you wish via the software. Now, whether you notice a difference will depend on the user, but I couldn't see much difference in my ghosting test. This is what the top mounted webcam looks like. So here's the 720p webcam. It looks the same as most 720p ones, to be honest with you. And uh, so this is what it looks and sounds like. And also when I type, the screen flex is also minimal due to its aluminum construction. And the keyboard deck is also made of black anodized aluminum with a nice big plastic Windows Precision trackpad highlighted by a blue and chrome accent. The keys have a good spacing and like the Triton 500 has a white paint around them providing a good contrast. The AWSD keys and the full size arrow keys are highlighted in blue, the latter functioning as screen brightness and volume controls. You still have space for a separate number pad together with the dedicated buttons to activate the Predator Sense software. I also like having a separate button to activate the turbo mode. The keys on my model are backlit blue only, and I have heard that to get RGB, you need to step up to the RTX models. Now, Acer has definitely upped their game in the aesthetics department. Even with the lid closed, you, you see a silver accent running along the length of the front edge. On the left, we have an air exhaust showing a blue anodized heatsink, power connector, ethernet jack, you have two USB 3.1 type A ports and a combo headphone mic jack. On the right, there is a USB-C port, and unlike the Triton, it's not Thunderbolt 3. We have a third USB 3.1 Type-A, a mini display port, and an HDMI 2.0, and an air exhaust. You can use the display port to connect to a FreeSync or G-Sync compatible display. The back of the laptop looks much nicer as well. Gone are the red trimmed air vents, replaced with blue anodized heat sinks. And you will notice that we now have a fan either side, versus the previous generation, which just had air pushed out of one rear heatsink. Underneath, it is made out of ABS plastic, like, like its predecessor, but it looks much nicer. The back panel pops off very easily, and as you can see, that it has decent air intakes. 
Last year you had panels to give you quick access to the hard drives and the RAM, needing only to remove the back here to upgrade the one M.2 drive it had. Now this year you need to take the back off totally for all of the upgrades. And once inside you get a 59 watt hour battery. Uh, since the laptop uses Optimus, I got five hours of runtime streaming YouTube at 25% brightness. Now personally, I would have liked to have had a larger battery instead of a two and a half inch bay, but I suspect they don't want to sabotage sales of the Triton model. Now they do offer a hard drive upgrade kit, which includes the rubber chassis and SATA cable, but they warn you about installing it uh, yourself because that may affect your warranty, which I do not like. It's easy to do though. You mount the rubber chassis to your drive and attach the uh, data cable to your motherboard. You do have a second open M.2 slot, which sub does support both SATA and PCI Express drives. Each slot comes with a thermal pad and heatsink and a screw to attach it all. Now by default, you only get a 256 gigabyte drive, so you will need to upgrade your storage for sure. At least you get two sticks of RAM giving 16 gigabytes. And the Wi-Fi card is the killer 1550i or the Intel 9560 and I got great download speeds even in my basement which is quite far from my access point. You do have two speakers that fire down at the front and you know these actually sounded okay at 77 decibels. They were fairly loud and can be tweaked using the Waves Max Audio software. Now the previous generation had two fans right next to each other sharing both heat pipes. Now this time around we have a more standard design with four heat sinks. One shared heat pipe and one separate one for both the GPU and the CPU. At five pounds, one ounces or 2.3 kilos, it is lighter than last year's model. And even with the 180 watt power brick, it only weighs six pound, five ounces or 2.86 kilos. So it is very portable. And I think, uh, you know, with its more subtle design, it makes for a good travel laptop. Now with just 180 watt power brick, I was concerned whether I would see battery drain and with it under full load, I saw a power pull of 179 watts, so it's definitely borderline. Now, that being said, I did not see any battery drain, so that is good. Its BIOS is rather basic and doesn't give you much in the way of options. The Predator Sense software is used to monitor the system temperatures and overclock the GPU and the CPU. Now, in my experience, the GPU power remains unchanged at about 85 watts, and in some games, you do see a clock speed boost, but in others, nothing and in all my game testing the extreme setting uh, ended up having about an 80 megahertz increase in average clock rate but the same peak of about 1902 megahertz the cpu was boosted on average by 150 megahertz now you do get good fan control and under load with the auto fan this is what the speed of the fans spin at at producing about 42 decibels of noise now activating the cooler boost option seems to do very little for this setting you will see CPU temperature spikes into the, into the 90s in games like PUBG. Max fans definitely crank up the fan speed and they are pretty loud at 54 decibels. And certainly if you don't use turbo mode, this will keep your laptop cool. Setting your fans up at about 80% will generate about 49 decibels of noise, but I found this generally reduced temperatures by around about five degrees Celsius and would be my preferred setting. Acer also undervolts the laptop by 125 millivolts out of the box and you know and this is good to see the chassis temperatures are pretty good though the center of the keyboard you know runs the hottest at about 36 degrees celsius and it's good to see that the heat is being exhausted out of the four heat sinks nicely and the only real hot spot being directly over the gpu which has it, which runs at about 47 degrees celsius which is fine the other useful bit of software is the ability to turn off the boot, lo boot logo animation and its sound and also to turn the panel overdrive on and off all in all though, the Helios 300 was a pleasure to game on, and if you missed my live gaming video, make sure to check it out. Now before I launch into the gaming benchmarks, let's look at how the 1660 Ti stacks up against other GPUs. According to Passmark's 3 d Mark, it is only 2.5% behind the RTX 2060 when in turbo mode. Now when you consider the 2060 model is 25% more expensive, then this bodes very well. The previous generation GTX 1060 doesn't look to be that far behind either and you can find laptops with this uh, gpu below one thousand dollars these days now this is a synthetic test so let's see what actual gaming is like we'll start off with games which will benefit with the turbo mode in overwatch epic settings the gpu is definitely boosting higher with turbo mode you are getting around about an extra 200 megahertz 
The peak CPU temperature was about the same in both cases, running at about 88 degrees Celsius. I also ran the game at other quality settings, and we see some nice scaling as we lower them down. For comparison, I throw in the results from a GTX 1060, which is 20% behind. The 2060 actually trailed it slightly, and the 2070 Max Q was about the same as a turbo boosted 1660 Ti. Now remember, the model with the 2070 Max Q is double the price. Now PUBG is another game that does well in turbo mode, which is shown on the right using ultra settings. We get an increase in GPU boost and more power to the CPU. With the auto fan in balance mode, I saw the CPU spike to 95 degrees, so I do recommend increasing that fan speed. With the max fan in turbo mode, it peaked at 91 degrees, which wasn't so bad. Again, I tested at different quality settings, but this time it didn't scale so well. Still, switching to high gives a great FPS. The GTX 1060 is 23% behind and the 2060 pretty much matches the 1660 Ti. And this is bad for a GPU that is $300 cheaper. The turbo boosted 1660 Ti matches the GTX 1070 Max-Q and is only 13% behind the 2070 Max-Q. Now Fortnite also saw an improvement using turbo mode as the GPU sees an extra 100 MHz boost. Frame rates are great and even touches 140 FPS at times. Lower in quality settings scales insanely well, going over 250 FPS at low. Again, the performance of the 1660 Ti is great, performing slightly faster than the 1070 Max Q and the RTX 2060. Battlefield 5 DX11 sees some benefit. Here it is at ultra settings. It's not a huge difference, in fact, the GPU only averaged an extra 70 MHz. In balance with auto fan, the CPU peaked at 91 degrees and averaged 83. Whilst using turbo and max fan, it peaked at 86 degrees, averaging at 81. The GPU ran cool for both, but certainly it was about 10 degrees cooler under turbo mode. Scaling at lower quality settings was also quite good, but you are not going to get near that 144 FPS mark. This time, this 1060 was only 13% behind, and unless you activated turbo mode, that gap jumps to 20%. The RTX 2060 was bang on with the 1660 Ti with turbo mode, and the 1070 Max-Q ran about the same. Even the 2070 Max-Q was only 6% faster, so again, this shows that the 1660 Ti is the value option. Far Cry 5 is definitely the hottest game in my arsenal. And with the auto fan in balance mode, the CPU averages 84 degrees Celsius, but it did peak to 95. Turbo mode with max fan fared a few, a few degrees cooler. So what I wanted to do was have a setting that you know would allow for a good balance between fan noise and heat without actually sacrificing performance. So what I did was I undervolted the core by 165 millivolts and left the cache at 125 millivolts and set the multipliers to 37. I also overclocked the GPU core by 196 megahertz and the memory by 200. I then set the fan speed at 80% and ran the system on balance mode. This shaved off a few degrees and matched the frame rate of turbo mode and lowered the fan noise. Not a bad combination. Adjusting quality settings, it helps it slightly, but not a huge amount. And in comparison to the other cards, we again pretty much matched the 2070 Max-Q. Finally, Shadow of the Tomb Raider DX12 using higher settings. I showed my overclock settings on the right and auto balanced on the left. As you can see, we get a nice frame rate boost, even beating the turbo mode. In fact, I saw a 10% improvement over turbo mode here, and this put it between the 2060 and the 2070 Max-Q. So how would I sum up the Helios 300? Well, from a performance perspective, the results speaks for themselves. Unless you want ray tracing or an RGB keyboard, I do not see the need to spend you know, so much extra money on the 2060 or the 2070 Max-Q models. I would save your money and put that into storage. Now it does run on the warm side, but I think it's still a little bit cooler than the previous generation. And mostly, you know, if you stay on the balance mode and set the fans to 80% level or higher, you will be fine. Turbo mode is a bit of a mixed bag, so personally, I would rather just do that myself using MSI Afterburner and Throttle Stop. But for those who don't want to tinker, it's an easy option at just one press of a button. The screen is very good. Sure, there's a bit of light bleed, but you don't notice it unless there is a total black screen. The chassis has been slimmed down. It does way less and it looks good. 
and at $1,200, I think it is very good value. Now, I'd like to thank you for watching. Remember to subscribe and like, and I'll see you next time. Bye.